Now that we have a recursive list class, let's talk about recursive list processing, which is similar to sequence processing in general. So recursive operations on recursive lists are typically recursive. In particular, they almost always involve a recursive call on the rest of the list. Let's look at an example. Let's say I create S123, and what's the rest of that? Well, that's just 2, 3. Let's define a function extend our list, which takes in two recursive lists, two instances of the our list class, and gives us back one our list with all the elements of the first, followed by all the elements of the second. So all the elements of s.rest is 2, 3, followed by 1, 2, 3, the elements of s. How do we define this? Well, we're going to use recursion to extend an R list with S1 and S2 has a base case which just checks if S1 is an empty R list. Now, if there are no elements in S1, then the concatenation of S1 and S2 is just whatever's in S2. So we'll return S2. Otherwise, what do we have to do? Well, we'll have to build a new our list, which has the first element of S1, and then all the other stuff in S1, and all the stuff in S2. In code, that says, build me an R list with S1.first as the first element, and then put together the rest of S1 and S2. And we can also use higher order functions on recursive lists, using the same kind of recursive structures. So we often want to conduct some operation on all elements of a list, or process a list as a whole, as opposed to just thinking about one element at a time. So what are some examples? Let's say we want to double all the numbers in an R list S. Well, how would we do that? Well, we double the first thing, and then double everything in the rest. How would we map a function, fun, over all the elements in S? Well, we'll apply fun to the first element, and put that together into an R list where the rest is just mapping fun over the rest of the list. How will we filter elements in S based on some function fun, which returns a true value or a false value, and we keep only the ones where fun of that element is true? Well, we either keep S that first or we don't, and then we filter the rest of the list. So as you can see, all these functions involve recursive calls, and they're all going to have the same base case, which is an empty list. When you have a list processing operation, and you get to the empty list, you just return it. Let's code up these examples. Okay, so the easy one first. Double an R list. Takes in S. If S is R list not empty, well then we'll return S. Otherwise, we'll return a new R list where we double the first element and then to construct the rest of the list we just double our list on the rest of the list. Double our list on S is 2, 4, 6 where S was 1, 2, 3. Okay, let's do another one map a function over s called fun. If s is empty, we're done. Otherwise, return whatever you get by calling fun on that first element. And then we have to map over the rest of the list that same function. So square is a function that takes one argument and returns its square. Squaring 4 would give us 16. Mapping over s, the square function, will give us 149. Let's keep it up. Filter an R list s according to a function involves checking whether it's empty. If it is, there's nothing to filter. Otherwise, 
Well, let's get the rest of the thing first. So that involves calling filter on the rest of the list. Okay, now there's two choices. Either we keep the first element or we don't. So we have to call button on the first element to figure out if we keep it. If we keep it, then we need to build ourselves a new R list with s.first in it and this rest of the list, which by the way, has already been filtered. Otherwise, we just return that filtered version. Okay, so even is a function that takes in one argument and figures out whether dividing it by two will leave a remainder of zero. 12 is even, 13 is odd. What happens if we filter s with the even function? We're left with only the even elements. Okay, let's do one more. The first thing we'll do is define a function range, which takes starting and ending numbers and returns a recursive list that contains all the increasing integers starting at start up to and not including end. So if start is bigger than or equal to end, then there's no elements in this thing. Otherwise, well, we'll just return an R list that starts with start and then it's followed by all the numbers starting with start plus one up and two, but not including the end. And let's build a big R list, which is what you get when you take S, but then you map over it a function that builds a range up to, but not including four. Okay, so SS is a list of lists. It's got a bunch of numbers in it, but each element is actually a list full of numbers. So how would we add all those up? Well, we could define a function, some list of lists, which is gonna take in some list s. And if s is empty, then certainly there are no values. What else could happen? Well. I could look at s.first and find it's supposed to be a list because this is a list of lists. We could find that it is empty. Well then, there's nothing there. So we'll just have to go about summing up the rest of the lists in s. Okay, so now we know S is not empty and its first element has more elements in it. So we're going to have to get everything except for that very first number in that very first list. So all but that first number is in our list, which starts out with the rest of that first element and then is followed by the rest of s. And the actual sum is the first element of the first element plus the sum of everything else, which is all but that first. Okay, so the question for you is what happens when we call some list of lists on ss? Think about it for a second and then I'll just run it. some list of lists on SS is 14. Why is that? Well, SS is one, two, three, followed by two, three, followed by three. So SSS, SS.first is one, two, three, and its first, first element is one. By this recursive procedure, we sum all the numbers in this entire thing until we get 14. 